In life, we will meet resistance, which can leave us feeling worn down and worn out. But we can find a reason to keep going. Show up, push through, and never give up. Well, this morning I wanted to share a little bit of my story with you. And some of y'all might have heard some of this before, but I feel like we're still getting to know each other a little bit. And so I wanted to share a little about who I am, where I came from, and how the heck I got here. So if that's okay with y'all, is that all right? Okay. I hope y'all are taking notes, by the way, this morning. Not necessarily on the part about my story, but we're going to get into some things, how it all ties together. And I want you to kind of, as you're listening, see yourself in this story. So um, something really relatable right off the top. My parents were in biker gangs. So I know y'all all feel that. You're like, same, same. My parents were in biker gangs. This was the life that I was born into. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is the life I was born into. They had committed crimes for years and years. They had done all of the drugs for years and years. Uh, it was actually just a big mess. Whatever you can think of, that's pretty terrible. They, they had done it. Um, in the early years, I remember, for me, I have two brothers. I'm the middle. And it was really rough for us growing up. Like, I didn't like it. I didn't like life. I didn't like, you know, not having food. I didn't like just the anger uh, and the, the violent environment and the things that we were exposed to at a young age. I didn't like crying myself to sleep. I didn't like the cops getting called. I, I, didn't, I didn't like it. It was tough. It was tough to keep a positive attitude as I'm going through like elementary school and then going home to, to that, if they were even there at all. But one place they took us was church. They always took us to church for some reason, because I guess it's like most parents, I want a better life for my kids than the one that I had. So they took us to church. And the thing I, I knew about church was that it was one of the places, probably the only place on earth at the time that, that I felt loved. It was one of the only places on the planet at the time that I felt like everything was okay. And I distinctly remember my parents arguing and fighting and like cussing each other out all the way to church and all the way back from church. But when they were in church, they were nice. They were like, hey, Tom, great to see you. How's the wife and kids? All right, spectacular. How's the job at LinkedIn? Good? Great. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. And, uh, and I was like, I like my parents when they're in this building. I like the way that people were treating me. They were asking me questions and encouraging and very supportive, and I appreciated that. So at a pretty young age, I gave my life to Jesus, not really knowing the extent of what that could possibly mean. But at the age of seven, I was like, Jesus, I love you. This is good. We got a good thing going. Can we keep doing this forever? Um, I liked it. I put a ring on it. And um, we've been doing that ever since, me and Jesus. We've been together, right? Uh, I was trying to find my way through middle school and high school. And I got into like a little bit of trouble because I remember this conflict in me of like, I'm at this, this, this like crossroads, right, where I could go this way and kind of venture down that path that my parents took and be like them, and, or I could go this way and, and do something better and something more meaningful and what I knew was probably right. I didn't get into like major, major trouble, but I remember that tension in my life of doing what I want and what I think I want and what looks fun and, and then doing what I know I probably should and what's right and, and good. Um... I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart, so that wasn't really hard to figure out who I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. I met Amber in uh, science class, and there was chemistry, y'all already know, and uh, we were in 10th grade, and same kind of thing. I was just like, I like you, let's just do this forever. Um, we started trying to have kids pretty early because of medical issues that, uh, you know, with, with her, and we didn't know if we were gonna be able to have kids, so it's like the doctors told us you either need to do it now or it's probably not gonna happen. So in the year 2013, we got married, and for the next two years, kept trying to have kids with no luck. After multiple miscarriages, we started to feel like this is not something that we are going to be able to do. And so we started looking into fostering and adopting. Uh, during the licensing process to become foster parents, we actually had our son, Emerson, and, um, which was a total miracle like on every level, the fact that <laughs> Good Lord. Um, 
Woo, I didn't expect it to get me. But yeah, like that's me holding Emerson whenever he was like two days old. Um, and then a year later, we had Everett. And Everett was born not breathing. And so the doctors were able to resuscitate him and get him into the neonatal intensive care unit and, uh, you know, get him stable. And, and he, he made it. Uh, but then my wife was, was another problem. She was not probably going to make it. Ended up having to have multiple blood transfusions. And uh, long story short, they, they both pulled through. And they're both here to, to tell the tale. But I remember almost losing them and then uh, being young and having two young babies and not knowing what the heck I was doing with my life. Like, it was just this mess. And when I look back on this time of my life, like, just to, just to paint the picture for you, um, I was in school, like, in college at the time. I was working two jobs at the time. I was donating plasma. That's why there's this gnarly scar on my vein. Uh, twice a week, because they would pay you $230 a month just so that we could afford food. And by food, I mean I was eating corn dogs and ramen. And we were also on government uh, assistance with WIC and food stamps just to try to, to eat. We were living in this horrible little tiny uh, one-bedroom apartment, all four of us and a cat. And in, like, the ghetto, there were stabbings. There was uh, theft all the time. Some homeless dude spent the night in my Jeep one night. And I'm like, well, there's that. Um, it was that kind of place. And I was just thinking, like, this is my life. This is my life right now. Um, but the medical issues kept coming. Like you think it's going to get better. And I, I, I'm experiencing this exercise in resilience. And I, I'm wondering, like, where is my hope come from? Like, why is this happening to me? When is it going to get better? And I remember just crying to my friends and my mentors and stuff all the time, like, I don't like this. And then, like, it just keeps coming, right? My wife and my son, Emerson, were diagnosed with a lifelong incurable disease within a year of each other, and this rocked our worlds. It's uh, type 1 diabetes. They have to have continuous blood glucose monitoring. They have to have insulin all day. Without those things, they will not live. So in the middle of this, for some insane reason that I can only attribute to the Lord, like, we continue to have this burden on our hearts for the orphan. Because back when we couldn't have kids, we, we became aware of the need that there were people all around us who, who were giving birth to children that they didn't want or who were violent and abusive. And knowing where I came from, like, I don't want a kid growing up in that situation, in that scenario. And so I want to do something about it. Even still, as insane as that sounded what it, with what our life looked like at the time, I still felt like I've got to do something about this. I can't know it, know this and not do something, right? So we started fostering um, kids, and we felt a specific call to uh, the medically needy and abandoned, abused, or neglected babies, like infants specifically. So for like seven years straight, we had this revolving door of infants coming through our house on top of our own two boys. And so there's Ari on the top left. There's Mercy and my son Emerson holding her. There's Ivy, which she didn't. She was born without a name. She was just abandoned at birth, so her name was Baby Girl. There's Yosef. We called him Joey. He was born with a cleft palate and a, no jaw, basically, so he had all these surgeries. Amelia in the beginning, um, big abuse story there. And then Maisie on the bottom left, looking like a class A dweeb. Um, <laughs> but I can say that because we ended up adopting her. And, um, and we adopted Ivy, baby girl. Her name is now Ivy Harpole. We gave her a name. But um, I remember in the time, because there's a point to all of this, why I'm telling you all of this, because I want you to know something. That I've asked the question, like, what what is going on? Is, is God even good? Because I didn't feel like any good things were happening in my life. I asked that question so many times. When life was hard and things kept happening that shouldn't happen and things didn't go according to plan and just when I thought I had it figured out, it all fell apart again. I had friends like walking away from us saying like, I don't even want anything to do with you guys. It was like a whole mess. It was so weird. And I kept saying like, God, are you sure this is what you want me to do? Is this, are you sure this is the call on my life? Because it sucks, bro. Like, I don't, it's hard. So if you have ever asked like, where is God in all of this? Some of y'all might be sitting here this morning thinking like, where is God in this? I want you to know, I know that feeling and you're not alone. 
I know what it's like to want to give up. I know what it's like to want to quit and to feel hopeless. I know what it's like to see no end in sight and to think this is how it's always going to be. You might be feeling like I might just always be a failure. I might never escape my stepdad. I might never escape myself. I might always hate myself. I might always be like this forever. And this is when I get to our word, resilience. Our word for the series, resilience. This is, the, this is the word that we're basing this whole series, Never Give Up, on. And the definition is simply this. It's the ability to keep on going even when times are hard. The ability to keep on going even when times are hard, that's resilience. That's what we need. That's what we've got to have if we're going to survive. And you might be thinking, Ren, like, I don't need resilience. My life is great. Like, my life is super chill. I don't have to, I'm not experiencing all that stuff. My parents weren't in biker gangs and stuff like that. Like, I'm just chilling. Like, things are, are actually pretty good. And to, to you, I say, like, well, it's great. Good for you. I'm so, I'm so glad, like, genuinely. But you know what? There will come a time when things are not that great. It, it will happen. And when that happens, you're going to need resilience. Otherwise, life might crush you. So don't be so arrogant to think that, like, ah, nothing, no trouble's ever going to come my way. You're kidding yourself, and the enemy is laughing at you when you say that. And you're thinking, like, Ren, whoa, that's pretty strong words, too. But they're not my words either. They're Jesus' words. I didn't say this. This is coming from him, the, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, you know, Jesus, the Son of God. We just got through celebrating his death, burial, and resurrection at Easter. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus is hanging out with some of his closest friends, and they had just been through everything together. They were like healing the sick, raising the dead, making the blind see, feeding a whole bunch of people with just a little bit of food, like doing amazing things together. They had all these memories, and now they're sitting there, and Jesus is like, yo, by the way, I'm about to leave. I'm leaving. And uh, they're like, what? What are we going to do? What are, what are we going to do? Are you still here? Do you still see me? Do you still care? Why would you? It's, it's confusing. They find themselves in that tension. And Jesus tells them this in, in John 16, 33. He says, he's like, look, I'm telling you all this stuff. I'm encouraging you. I'm saying I'm about to leave, but I'm about to send a, a helper, the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I want you guys to have peace. They're like, how can we have peace right now? You're telling me you're about to leave. Our whole world's about to fall apart. Like, what are we going to do without you? He says, I want you to have peace because in the world, you're going to have tribulation. That doesn't make any sense. Tribulation is like trouble, trials, like difficult things, hard things. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. It's, it's a biblical guarantee. And Jesus said it like, it will come. So how can I have peace if I'm going through tribulation? That's like in the middle of a total disaster, someone is like, stay calm. And you're like, stay calm. There's literally a bear outside my tent and I have all the food in here. I can't stay calm. I can't stay calm right now. But Jesus wouldn't have said it if it wasn't possible. He wouldn't have said that peace is possible in the middle of trials if it wasn't. The Apostle Paul, he shares his story. It's way gnarlier than mine. I wanted to share it with you. It was actually on the, the game that we read earlier. It's, it's 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27. How many words are in the, don't count them. He says, I've been put into prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me the 39 lashes. Remember when Jesus, before he was crucified, they gave him the 40 lashes minus one because they found out that on the 40th uh, lash across the back, people would often bleed out and die. So they gave him 39 just to keep him just on the cusp of death but alive. He received this five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and not in the 420 type of way. Okay, that was last week. He's talking about people throwing rocks at you until you die. He survived that. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. And they didn't have the life jackets and, and like the little whistles and lights that we got today either. He survived that. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I'm getting it from all directions. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. Literally everywhere I go, I'm facing danger. I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. The church people... I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty. 
I've gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And this is the guy who wrote over half of our New Testament. This is the guy who wrote over half of our New Testament. He had every reason to quit and every reason to give up and every reason to stop believing in Jesus and to say, you know what, God, you have abandoned me. Horrible things continue to happen. But he never quit on God. He never gave up. He never said, you know what? If God was really good and if God was really there, then none of this would be happening to me. So you know what? I'm an atheist now. He never, he never said that. But where does that come from and how do we get it? How can we experience peace when all we see are problems? Well, Paul tells us this. Dear brothers and sisters, he's like, I've not achieved it. And by it, I mean knowing Jesus fully. He's like, I'm not there. I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. I still make mistakes, and he did, and, and so do I, so do all of us, right? He's like, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm not going to focus and dwell on the past, the things that I can't change. I'm going to look ahead and press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul knew what I discovered in my life. And Paul knew what I, I hope for all of us, for all of you, that knowing Jesus changes everything. I found it out kind of by accident at age seven. I found it out kind of by necessity because I needed something better. But the truth still remains. Knowing Jesus changes everything. He is the key. And you're thinking, Ren, like, duh, this is church. Like, of course, you're just going to say, Jesus, and then slap that Band-Aid over it all and just say everything's going to be okay. But I'm not saying everything's going to be okay. Like, you're still going to have problems. You're still going to have trials. This guy who wrote half of our New Testament, the Bible that you hold in your hand, that's the stuff he experienced. And he still loved and worshiped God just the same, maybe even more. As Christians, we know that there's going to come a day when God makes everything all right right? Like we know there will be a day when everything, there's no more pain, there's no more tears, and, and we cling to this hope, and we look forward to it. We believe in it. We have faith that this is not the end, that this pain is not forever. And how can we have this hope? He says it, look, in the second uh, part of the verse that we read earlier, Jesus, Jesus said it. He said, I've said these things to you, and so that in me you might have peace, in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, be encouraged. I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. He overcame death, right? Like we just talked about on Easter last week. He can overcome whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through in your life too. He can be your rock, your solid foundation, your encouragement, your peace, your hope. When everything else feels like it's falling apart and nothing makes sense and you're lost and confused and you don't like anything, if you find yourself in that place, listen, Jesus sees you, he knows you, and he loves you. He's right there and he's working it all out. There is an ending to this story. You can't see it maybe right now, but he's working. He's working. He's working. See, Paul met Jesus face to face, the resurrected Jesus. He had already died, and Paul sees him, the resurrected Jesus. And, and what you've got to know about Paul is that he was this guy who persecuted Christians. He hated Christians at one point. He had them captured, he had them killed, and he was now ready to dedicate his entire life to following him no matter the cost. I wonder, have you met Jesus? Have you met the one who overcame death? the one who's going to help you in times of trouble when they come. And I hope they don't come. I hope they don't come like super big and super bad like this. Maybe you find yourself here this morning and you know Jesus already and you're like, I know him, but I want to know him more. I want to know him more deeply. May you build your faith on the hope that we have in Jesus and the promise that he's working all things together for his good. May you find resilience. May you never give up. May your life be this living testimony that you can share with a group of people one day. And you say, you know what? I've felt that way before. I felt lost and confused before. I felt like it was all falling apart before. But God, I felt like that. But take heart. Because Jesus overcame it. And that's why I give all the glory to him for, for where I'm at today. It's not because of my own doing. Look, if it was up to me, I would have quit a long time ago. But something in me, and I, I know it's the Holy Spirit, is just saying, keep going. 
don't quit, don't give up. There's a reason, there's a plan, there's a purpose, there's ministry happening, and I'm building the foundation for it right now. And I've gotten to help so many people that I never would have imagined. Like, God is just so good. Like, where I came from, the family I came from, no way should I be here right now. No way. How much more is he going to do through all of you guys? How much can we just change the world with this group of people right here? Like, that's the stuff that gets me excited. That's the stuff that gets me fired up because I want you all to know I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest cheerleader. I'm right here with you. Like, I will support you, and I don't believe that anyone is too far gone. I don't believe that there's anyone too small or too untalented or too ungifted that God can't use because, look, you are talented. You are gifted. You are beautiful. You are competent. You're capable. You're smart. You are an amazing creation and child of God. And, look, like, you can do way more than you think you can do. Y'all receive that this morning? Like, you can do way more than you think you can do. Don't let the lies of the enemy and the lies of the world tell you that you can't do stuff because there's a God in heaven who can overcome death, who's on your side. He's fighting your battles. He's arm in arm with you. You can get through anything. You can get through anything. God's working your story out too. So trust him with it. He loves you. Receive that. You might not be able to do it, but he can.